So good day. So today we get to talk about the concepts and the components of an IPM program or what is known as integrated pest management, which is gonna be a very important component of having healthy plants because plants are gonna be attacked by different insects. Plants are gonna be attacked by different diseases. Plants are gonna have many things that are gonna eat or feed upon them. And so dealing and managing those problems are gonna be a very important component of just general garden maintenance or uh, maintaining uh, the health or to maintain the health of a plant or have plants be happy and healthy. Uh, so on this first image, we have just general diseases uh, for the plants, uh, just to show you some that every single portion, the leaves, the stems, the roots can all be affected by many, many things. Uh, the concepts of IPM or integrated pest management started uh, many years ago with uh, a pest that was introduced into California known as the Cotney Cushion Scale. It devastated uh, the citrus industry. And what happened is that the insect was introduced from a different part of the world and the natural predators, the natural control, the biological control of the insects were not here. And so without a natural control, the insects can then multiply and multiply. And uh, eventually there are going to be so many insects around that they are going to overwhelm the plant. And by overwhelming, meaning they are going to continuously feed on it, then they're going to uh, kill or can potentially put it under stress, put the plant under stress and could potentially kill it or something else can take the opportunity to kill the plant. Uh, so this was the beginning and uh, there was a very famous scientist who uh, discovered that lady beetles or lady bugs were going to be a very good way to control these insects and in fact uh, he brought them over, he raised them uh, grew them and released them. And sure enough, in a few years, uh, the number of this cotton cushion scale went very, very low, was very low, and the insect was under control. So what happened is that the insect did not get exterminated. The insects are here. But by having a biological control, that prevents their number from skyrocketing to the point where they're going to be a problem. So keep that in mind because there is no such thing as a bad insect. Uh, the insects are just doing what nature has intended for them to do, and that is to feed off of a specific plant. And there's not going to be any real eradication. You can control them and keep their population down. Uh, and so for our purpose, we are going to mention what a pest is, and just by definition, uh, a pest is going to be all biological organisms, meaning that that could be a bacteria, that could be a virus, could be a viroid, could be a phytoplasm, could be a fungi, could be an insect, could be a mite, could be a nematode, could be a weed, could be a parasitic higher plant like uh, mistletoe or daughter, could potentially be birds and or even mammals. Uh, that interfere with the production of plants. So anything that you would consider as being bad for the plants that you're growing could potentially be a pest. Uh, so it could be an animal, it could be an insect, and it could also be plant. Uh, so here are just some more examples. So when we're looking at a pest, we might have invertebrates. That is gonna be your insects and roaches. Yes, because we deal with roaches as well. Uh, so roaches are going to be a home pest or a kitchen pest. Uh, so any kind of stinging insect could also be a pest. The wasps that are going to be taking your hamburger when there's a picnic. Uh, and ants who are just going to be uh, raiding uh, the picnic area and taking all the food they can get. So those are examples of invertebrate, meaning there's no backbone. Uh, then we're going to have the vertebrate uh, pests, which are going to be some of the bigger animals, such as gophers that are going to make tunnels in the ground, and people may then fall and break some limbs, some food, uh, their ankle. Uh, some ground squirrels that could potentially carry the plague, 
or rats and mice that could eat some of the food or do some damage. So those are some of the ver uh, vertebrates. Then we have some of the weeds or the plants. Uh, so plants or weeds, unwanted plants that are gonna grow along the tree basin, fence line, uh, hardscape in parking lot, or even in athletic fields as an example, or some of the plant pathogen or diseases such as mildews, fungi, and or other rotting diseases. So those are just like some of the examples. And then there's gonna be some aquatic pests. So the state of California, the Department of Health uh, is constantly monitoring for mosquitoes or areas where mosquitoes are going to be able to be, uh, to be, to grow. Uh, any stagnant water will be a problem. And so they routinely visit some of the lakes and some of the waters and also some of the unkept pools uh, because we know that those are gonna be wonderful breeding grounds for mosquitoes that can now carry the West Nile virus and or some of the other new diseases to humans that are gonna come later on. Unfortunately, we recently got the introduction of the Asian tiger, tiger beetle that is becoming a bigger problem. Uh, so mosquitoes, aquatic pests uh, are gonna be a big problem. Uh, and then when we look at the insect pests, we're just gonna have some of the few, the ones that are gonna be feeding on plants. We are gonna have the aphids, which are gonna be known as uh, plant louse or plant lice because they are gonna be feeding on the sap or the blood of the plant. Uh, just like a regular head lice for a human will feed on the blood uh, when they're in your head. Uh, and then we're gonna have the mealy bugs, which are also gonna be uh, insects that can feed on the sap of the plant. Uh, we're gonna have scales uh, and then we're gonna have white flies. So these are just four general examples of some of the more common uh, insect pest that if you're going to grow a plant here in Southern California at any given point uh, throughout the life of that plant, you will be dealing with some of these insects because they will find your plant and they will feed on it. When we're dealing with some of the insect pests, we need to know that they are a type of arthropods, which all it means is that they're jointed legs. Uh, and part of the arthropod group are gonna include some of the sea crustaceans like uh, shrimps and lobsters. Obviously those have their niche in the water, so they're not gonna bother us. Uh, there's gonna be the centipedes and the millipedes that are also gonna be part of the arthropod groups. And there's also gonna be the spiders or the arachnids that are gonna be also part of the arthropods group. So arthropods just means jointed legs. And that's what you have here uh, where the legs of the insects are gonna be kind of have a joint. Uh, here is a, a roly poly or a, a peel bug as it's sometimes referred. And this is a land crustacean. So it found a niche, just uh, being able to come out of the water and now it's completely terrestrial. They cannot go back to the water and uh, it's gonna feed on very on small decaying vegetation. Every so often they may feed on a seedling plant when they're very young or some strawberries that are ripened and they touch the ground, they probably gonna get eaten by some of this. Uh, they are good for the soil. They are good for recycling nutrients and it's nothing more than that sea crustacean that is out there. Uh, but when we look at the insects, we are gonna be looking at what we refer to as the true insects. Uh, the true insects are gonna have three main body parts. Towards the front, we're gonna have the head. The head is gonna have a pair of antennae. Uh, only true insects have antennae. The antennae are gonna be good for feeling and also to detect chemicals. There's gonna be the mouth and the mouth is gonna play a major role because depending on the shape of the mouth is going to tell us the diet of the insect, whether the insect feeds on uh, the leaves or whether the insect feeds on the sap or whether the insect feeds on other parts of the plant. And then the eyes that we'll be able to see. Behind uh, the head is gonna be the thorax. The thorax is gonna have a pair of wing when their insect has them, because some insects are not gonna have wings. Uh, so if the wings are present, they're gonna be carried by the thorax. Uh, and then also six pairs, uh, six legs or three pairs of legs. Uh, true insects will have six legs. 
so then those are going to be housed within the thorax. And behind the thorax, we have the abdomen that is going to have uh, the ovipositor for laying eggs, as well as uh, the reproductive components and or the digestive component, uh, and also the spherencles. Uh, the spherencles that you see right here, those are going to be tiny openings on the side of the insect body. And that those are going to be responsible for gas exchange, for breathing. And those are going to become very important because when one of the methods for controlling insect pests is to use oils or horticultural soaps. Uh, and those can only work if you completely saturate the insect with that product so that the spherinkles are going to be clogged or blocked by the oils or the soap. And when the spherinkles are blocked, then the insect will die out of suffocation because it cannot breathe. So that is the method of how those products are going to work. Uh, so this will be a true insect. Uh, so when we look at the head, we can see here a grasshopper, a grasshopper uh, hopper with uh, mandibles and jaws that are going to be used for chewing leaves. And we know that grasshoppers and many insects that have these mandibles with very strong jaw can have, will have no problem in devouring leaves and defoliating plants. Uh, when the insect has acquired a liquid diet, such as a moth or a butterfly, then they can Shift, shift or change their mouth into what is known as a proboscis. So a very long straw for butterflies that they will be able to unfurl and they will be able to probe uh, deeper in the flowers to take the nectar from them and they will feed on it. So this is the proboscis of a butterfly or a moth. Or with flies, uh, we have a mouth part, mouth part that is gonna be shaped like a sponge. So they're just gonna vomit digestive enzymes and so as the enzymes are going to be digesting whatever they're going to eat then they kind of go out there and sponge their food or their liquid uh, and that's how they're going to feed or when a fly lands on your hand they're going to be sponging your sweat because it has some salt uh, and that's in order the liquid and that's how they're going to be drinking or eating so sponge for flies uh, and there's a different view or face view of the mouth of the fly and here's how it actually looks uh, with a microscope that I took um, this photograph many years ago. Uh, and or for insects that have specifically evolved to feed on plants, we have a stylet or a syringe or a dagger-like mouth part that is gonna be very sharp and it is made to stab the plant, reach the vascular system, the xylem and the phloem, and then drink the sap and so it is hollow it is like a straw uh, and so the insects like the mealybug the insects like the aphids insects like scale and white fly and the true bug that we see here have this very specialized mouth part known as a stylet for feeding off of the sap of the plant uh, and that's evolution and that's how it works so when not in use the stylet is going to be held uh, along the body and when they need it, they'll bring it out, stab the plant and begin to drink. Uh, and then we have the antennae that are gonna be very important for seeing or detecting chemical signals. So insects communicate through pheromone. Uh, so the insect is gonna release pheromone and that's how insects may find each other or able to read the environment around them. And here's a moth, obviously they're nocturnal. So they're gonna rely more on their antennae that will be have a good receptor for pheromones uh, than their eyes because they're gonna be kind of blind. Uh, and then when we look at the thorax, so here's uh, the wings as well as uh, the legs. Uh, so here are the wings for the grasshoppers. So the first ones are not gonna be that important for flight, but the colorful ones will. Uh, and uh, here's the legs. Uh, the insects will have a claw uh, and that's what's going to allow them to climb walls or climb plants and also hold on to the plants and they don't fall unless they choose to. Uh, but the legs may change depending on uh, the type of insect. So grasshoppers, crickets will have a very big back leg for jumping and or flying. 
Uh, and then we have the ovipositor, so in the abdomen where we have that egg laying apparatus uh, for laying the eggs for the females, as well as the digestive uh, organs and uh, the other part of the insect that is going to be important for their biological function. And so here is a cricket with a very muscle feel uh, back leg for doing a big gigantic jump. And this one has lost one leg, one limb to probably a bird. Uh, and here's the mole cricket uh, that have a very strong front leg because uh, they need to dig. Uh, and so they need to tunnel, whereas their back legs are going to be very puny. What's also important for you to know is that insects are going to carry out a type of life cycle, either complete or incomplete. Uh, an incomplete life cycle, the insect will start from an egg, and then uh, it's uh, young, all the stages or the nymphal stages for the incomplete life cycle, it's going to start uh, with a very young insect, and the next life is going to be very similar. So they're simply going to change their skin. Uh, the insects have exoskeleton, which means that they're uh, skeletons on the outside. So as the insects get older, they'll change their skin. Uh, and so each time the insects uh, sheds their skin and gets bigger, it's just going to be a bigger version of what, what you started until it becomes an adult. And so this is going to be the incomplete, starts with an egg, the young is hatched, then the next stage of life or the next cycle is going to be a big, little bigger version of it. And little bit of version uh, versus a complete, which is where we're going to have that complete metamorphosis or that complete life cycle where we have the egg that will go into a larval stage. The larval stage is going to grow through several stages. And then the insect is going to enter what is known as the pupa stage. Uh, the pupa stage where the entire body of the insect is going to be kind of melted and then reconstituted into the adult form. So in a complete life cycle, you're going to have the juvenile that is going to be very different, completely different than the adult uh, stage versus the incomplete. It looks very similar, just a smaller version of it. Uh, and then we have uh, the wings, uh, the wings on a beetle here. Uh, the red ones are going to be the four wings. Uh, that in beetles it is modified into an elytra, and that's what the ALE stands for. And then you have the flight wings uh, that are going to be important for flights. And then we're going to have another very popular insect pest. These are going to be known as thrips, and uh, they're going to have a kind of like a rasping mouth part, uh, but they can be identified by their wings. They're going to be fringe, or they're going to look like a comb. Uh, and so here is one of the more popular uh, the Cuban laurel fig uh, thrips, and here's some of the damage. The damage is going to be silvery uh, because they have damaged the cells that carry out the production of the chlorophyll, and now uh, they are unable to produce it, and that's why they're going to be silvery. And you can see some of the juvenile thrips hiding right here. Uh, and then we have the spiders, arachnids. Uh, that spiders are not going to be bad guys. Yes, there's some that can bite, that can cause human death. But for the most part, spiders are just going to be good guys that are going to be in the garden. They're going to be eating insects. They are going to be predators, uh, but there's nothing to really worry about. Uh, so don't kill them if you see them in your garden because they're just doing their job. However, Part of the arachnid is going to be the mites. Uh, and in this case, for plants, we have the spider mites that are going to be extremely problematic. Uh, so this is the two-spot spider mite. And uh, it is a type of arachnid. It can build a web or produce a web. And so here is the tip of the leaf that is completely engulfed with the webbing because you see uh, dozens of insects all over, some juveniles, some adults. And so in large numbers, they can definitely overwhelm the plant and cause serious problem. For people that grow plants hydroponically in warehouses, this is going to be the biggest problem, not the other ones. Spider mites will be the biggest problem. And then we have diseases that are going to be caused by fungi. Uh, some of them are going to be rust, as in the case of this oxalis rust, or powdery mildew, as in the case of powdery mildew for roses. 
so diseases are also going to be prevalent out there and they could have some impact on the plant. So when we are dealing with controlling the uh, problem, uh, one method that we can use is going to be the use of biological control, meaning a natural predator. So they are, there's uh, places, markets, uh, companies that their job is to raise some of these predators uh, that you can purchase and then release them into the garden. Uh, so it's going to be predator insects or mites. So here's a uh, minute pirate bug as well as predatory mites and different types of microscopic, not microscopic, but very tiny, tiny wasps and flies. Uh, there's also going to be some beneficial nematodes that can be used in the soil or also beneficial fungi and or bacteria as well. Uh, one of the more common fung uh, bacteria, uh, Vaselis syringensis, VT for short, it's been used for controlling caterpillars or other uh, wire worms in corn. And so it's also used for controlling mosquito larvae. And uh, it's, it's something that you would put on the plant and when the insect feeds on these bacteria spores, then the bacteria spores germinate in their stomach and it kills them. So this uh, Vaselis syringensis, BT, is a common product. And so when we look at the problem, we have a plant, there's something feeding on it, I can determine it's a problem. There's some important objectives that you need to take into consideration. Number one, minimizing the health, uh, the hazard to human health and the environment. In the old days, people used to spray just whatever chemical they found. And obviously we have done some serious damage to the environment and you don't wanna be spraying or using chemicals unwisely. So minimize the impact to human health and the environment. Uh, you still wanna maintain the health of the trees, the shrubs, the flower beds, and any of the natural areas. We still want the plants to uh, be there and be happy and healthy. Uh, you need to monitor to ensure that the selective control uh, of the pest population is working because just releasing the insect is not just going to magically happen. Sometimes there's going to be environmental changes that are going to prevent it from happening. So monitoring the area, monitoring the numbers is going to be very important. Uh, minimize the pesticide use, uh, either through the use of target applications. Uh, so that's going to be very important. Uh, when you're going to be using pesticides, you want to make sure that you begin with a product that is going to have the least toxicity. See if that controls the problem. If it doesn't, then you can go to the next level, then the next level until you definitely have to use some of those harsher products. But using the concepts of IPM does not say organic. This is not an organic method. This is just more a wiser method of controlling insect than just using the chemicals first and then everything else later. So you use everything else and the chemical is gonna be your last resort. Uh, and then the cost of operation. So if you have a plant that is worth $2, but the chemical is gonna be worth 20, is it really feasible? Or is it, is it easier to let that plant die and then get yourself a replacement plant for a lot less? So that's gonna be very important. So the goals of our IPM program again, is to properly manage the pests. So we want to control the insect numbers, the population numbers, uh, and uh, manage the environment because we don't want to pollute the environment. Uh, to balance the benefit uh, of control, the cost, the public health, and environmental safety. A big definition, but that kind of covers it all. Uh, so when beginning, you want to start with a cultural practice. Is uh, my plant really healthy, healthy? Am I growing it in the right place, the right location, the right amount of sunlight? Am I giving it the proper amount of water? So those are cultural changes that you can begin to take to increase the health of the plant. And a healthy plant will fend off a lot of the attacks and or be resistant to a lot of the attacks. Uh, from there, you can go into more of the manual or mechanical methods. Uh, somehow using water to spray down the insects, lower the population numbers, that could be beneficial. Uh, so from there, you can use the biological. The biologicals are going to be expensive and they're going to take time and they're sometimes not going to be effective the first time. So you might need to apply them several times. 
uh, but biological methods like those predatory wasps are going to be good or another option. And then as a last resort, you can go for the chemicals. Uh, then you can use start with your oils, your soaps, and then go from there to some of the harsher ones. Uh, and so pesticides, as mentioned before, is not organic. It can still be used if there is a need for them. Uh, so here's uh, the structure of IPM, integrated pest management. Observe the presence of pests and monitor population. Make sure you ID the pest properly so that you know who you're dealing with. An insect walking on a plant is not always a pest. It's insects living on the plant. So don't assume and don't declare war on an insect that is just walking on a plant. So make sure that whatever you're declaring war to is going to be the insect that is causing or feeding on the plant. So proper IDing the problem is gonna be very, very important. Apply the corrective action uh, when you see a damage that you cannot tolerate uh, or when you see your know, insect numbers that are gonna be very high, that's up to you to determine. Uh, selective targeting uh, of the pest and you can use uh, certain products that are gonna be like a spot treatment or you can use some of the mechanical ways to deal with some of the insects. Uh, maintain the plant health to optimize uh, pest tolerance, keep the plants happy and health, increases their immune system and their defenses, uh, and then maintain the structural integrity in the sanitation of buildings, and that is going to be for greenhouses or if you're dealing with uh, house pests, that's going to be the kitchen and or everything else. And uh, the key uh, components of IPM uh, is uh, know the pest population. One insect is not a problem. Two insects is not a problem. A thousand insects may be a problem. So one insect walking under the plant is not a problem. Uh, educated prediction of the pest number, and you can determine I can tolerate a hundred insects. I can tolerate a thousand insects. I can tolerate more than that. And then the amount of damage likely to occur. Losing one plant, losing my entire garden, losing my entire crop, or maybe not losing any of them at all. So with that, I will uh, thank you. Have a great day.